Glass here coming to you from Zoomlandia, and I have a very special guest here today. It is the author of this book, The Power of Knitting. It does not come with this and this. This is all me. <laughs> and uh, so please introduce yourself. Well, so I'm Loretta Napoleoni, and I've been knitting since I was six. My grandmother told me. But uh, I'm an economist. I've done um, a lot of work on the financing of terrorism. Uh, uh, the dark side of globalization. So I wrote lots of books about these topics. And this is my first book about knitting, which is really not only knitting, it's about uh, the history of knitting, um, uh, the meaning that knitting has had uh, in uh, women's life, uh, but also in uh, minorities' uh, life, you know, the people that were all constantly at the fringes of politics and history. Um, so it's a different kind of book. Plus, you know, it's also a book that tells my personal story through a very bad time, how knitting uh, uh, helped me to go through this uh, dark period of my life. Uh, so, and in the end, uh, at the, there are also a few patterns. Uh, each chapter has a pattern that symbolizes uh, what is the message of the chapter. And they're all quite easy. So it's for everybody, um, also because uh, I am not a super knitter. I mean, I do knit, but I'm not one of those amazing people that I know that can do very complicated uh, patterns. Well, I have had a chance to spend some time with the book. And so I have a lot of takeaways that I thought you could comment on today. I do want to say it is interesting when you look up your name, let's say on a, a, like Amazon, for example, you'll see books with words like Islam and terrorists and Iraq and North Korea. <laughs> and then suddenly this pink cover pops up and it's also by you, The Power of Knitting. So it is a very fascinating juxtaposition. And I think that the marriage of especially your personal story, as you mentioned, but also economics and knitting together is a really interesting tie-in with this book. Yes, I mean, I must say I was a bit nervous uh, at the beginning because it's really difficult for um, well-established authors uh, in a certain field uh, to transition uh, to another field. Uh, plus, you know, these are really two very, very different fields. You know, one is craft, the other one is international economics and politics. So, um, but I think uh, times are different. Um, if I had done something like this 20 years ago, it would have been much more difficult. Uh, today, people um, tend to be more understanding about the different sides uh, of um, people's life, personality, also people change jobs. So because of that, uh, nobody really looked down at me like saying, what does this woman know about knitting? Um, I also think that the knitting community is, uh, is actually quite positive. Uh, um, I mean, I'm sure there are tension also in, inside uh, the industry of yarn uh, and knitting. But overall, I find that people that knit because they enjoy knitting, because they do it for love, because they do it for, uh, for people that they love, um, are uh, very very nice to the others. I mean, nobody ever judge you like saying, oh my gosh, you did a terrible, terrible sweater. <laughs> this is awful, the color is awful. <laughs> nobody ever says that, maybe because uh, uh, everything that is produced um, is produced by your hands, so it's a craft, so it takes time, so it takes a tremendous effort, concentration. So nobody wants to offend uh, these parts of the work. I so feel like we honor the handmade before we judge it, right? We honor that it's yeah. So before we dive into some of the, the specifics of this book, I do want to talk about the cover being pink. I wore pink, I wear pink often anyway, but I specifically <laughs> wore my pink sweater because of the cover. I learned that, that the color pink can be very polarizing for people. Why did you choose pink for this book? 
Well, I wanted pink. In fact, you know, all the edition apart from the Swedish edition is pink because uh, the, the Swede had a completely different cover. But um, I think, um, I mean, number one, the pussy hat uh, um, movement uh, used pink uh, in a political way. Yeah, in yeah, fact. She uh, even has an illustration. The, the, you can see the illustration. And I thought, um, and I thought that that was uh, a very good idea because people tend to associate pink, uh, at least people of my generation associate pink with Barbie. You know, so you know, Barbie wears pink as a concept. But the truth is that if you really want to get out of that cage, uh, being a woman, especially, and you know, it's not only women; it's also gays, also transsexual. I mean, you know, that pink is a little bit. Uh, like the cage of all these people who are not the male dominant alpha men. I think uh, using pink as a weapon is uh, almost doubling the impact that is going to have upon people. Uh, and that's why you know, I choose pink and I choose specifically a shocking pink, uh, not like, you know, the, the, the jumper you're wearing, because uh, I really wanted to make a point uh, about uh, that pink. You know, the, I was thinking about that film, uh, um, Legally Blonde. The title of Legally Blonde, it is with that color. And I thought, wow, you know, uh, there is an association about the fact that she appeared to be really lightheaded and, you know, really pretty not brain and then in reality she was you know super bright brighter than everybody else so so it's a bit like that uh, to to use the pink yeah just last night i was talking to my eight-year-old and she said you know mom i want to be a nerd because i want to be smart and know everything and i said you know you don't have to be a nerd to be smart like <laughs> you can be yeah. smart and be exactly who you are so it is interesting how it just yeah. sort of you know gets into their little bodies at such a young age that being smart means something, right? And it can't be something else. Okay, so let's dive into the book. So, I, have, I don't have a lot of experience uh, mm -hmm. interviewing authors and I don't wanna have spoilers or give something away. So if I bring something up in the book that you want to you know, just respond and say, you should read the book for that, please do so. I, you know, I don't- That is okay, I mean, yeah. Okay. yeah. So I wanna talk about your grandma because you have these awesome quotes from her, uh, quotes like knitting is an act of love and I'm obsessed with the the love story at the beginning of the book. Do you wanna- Oh yeah, it's a beautiful love story, yeah. You wanna tell us that? Yeah, sure, I mean, yeah, of course. Um, so uh, my, my grandmother, she was born in uh, 1900 and she had lots of brothers and sisters that were 10 actually. So when uh, World War I started, uh, uh, some of their brothers, you know, went to fight in the trenches. Uh, and one in particular um, met uh, um, another man who was uh, in the trenches with them, uh, same age, quite young, uh, in their early 20s. Uh, and um, he didn't have anybody that would knit for him. Now, in the book, I do tell the story of how women in World War I and World War II were actually knitting socks, mostly, uh, because of the uh, trench food. So th these people were in the trenches, uh, and the trenches were constantly wet, and they got this fungus in their feet. So the only way to basically uh, cure this fungus or prevent it was to have constantly dry feet, which is almost impossible. So they needed socks. And um, of course, uh, the army didn't have uh, these socks. So the women did these socks. So my grandmother was making socks, but also was making other things, was making jumpers, was making you know, hats to put under the helmet because these people were constantly freezing cold. Plus my um, uncle and my future grandfather were actually in the Alps. So it was really, really cold in the winter. So uh, my grandmother brother shared uh, these items that she knitted uh, with this friend. And then one day there was an attack um, and my uncle died. And the, the man who be, become my grandfather was injured, seriously injured. So he was taken to hospital and then by the time 
he came out of hospital, um, the war was over. So he decided to go and visit the family of his friend uh, to tell them about the last days of his friend life, but also to thank this woman who had kept him warm uh, in the trenches. And the only thing he had uh, were the socks that he was wearing the moment in, in which you know, he was injured. So he brought these socks back to my grandmother. And they met, uh, and of course, you know, uh, they realized uh, that they had fallen in love during during this time because you know she was knitting for him and she was reading the letters of her brother and she was curious about this man and this man had fallen in love with her while he was wearing um, her clothes and so that was it you know they got married it was a great love story and they were very much in love and then he died uh, when she was 56 years old and she she really never fully recovered meaning that she she carried this amazing love story inside of her and she was telling me uh, all the details of their love together so so that's the story that's how the book starts so basically i wouldn't be in here if it wasn't for those socks i love that you know he could bring that knitted object back to her and i just can't imagine the moment when she recognized her own handwork in the hands of who would be yes, her husband. yes and he apologized because of course he the the socks um, were stained with blood because of course and they couldn't get out the the blood so yeah yeah it was um, so your grandma has uh, taught you things like a good knitter has wisdom a good knitter always treasures her mistakes and you say that your grandmother was fearless like all excellent knitters so Talk about some of those character traits. I didn't, I mean, I think you're right. I think we do have to be fearless as knitters, right? Yeah, I mean, she, yes, she was fearless. She was, uh, she was fearless about everything. I mean, she was not afraid of anything. She, she would tell me about the war, for example. And uh, I was petrified at the thought of the war, but she was, uh, she was okay. I mean, she, she accepted. See, this is why when, uh, I went through my personal uh, tragedy, really. Mm. I didn't know what to do, meaning, uh, what do you do in a situation uh, uh, unexpected uh, uh, when something that you thought would never ever happen to you, it, then it happens and you're confronted with it. Um, and I didn't know, uh, nothing that I uh, studied uh, or I learned through my life, uh, as a professional had prepared me for something like that. So my grandmother teaching uh, came to me saying, uh, you, know, you shouldn't be afraid of anything. I mean, you just go through the difficulties uh, uh, and you come uh, out at the other end. Uh, and no matter you know, how hard it is, uh, you are a survival, you need to survive. Um, and the knitting, uh, was um, for me therapeutical because of course she had taught me all of this and when we were knitting together. So each time uh, I was knitting, it was almost like reconnecting uh, with my childhood and adolescence uh, and re finding the voice of this woman, of course, you know, died uh, several years ago and I couldn't go and talk to her about what should I do, how should I move? But in the end, I didn't need to because her voice was inside uh, on myself. So that was the greatest gift, I think, that she, she gave me is that kind of wisdom that I didn't even know it was there, but then it came out. You give her credit also for your love of economics because of... Yeah her sleeping beauty her version of sleeping beauty it's great yeah it's absolutely amazing well so yeah do we, we yeah we can say the story of sleeping beauty also it's no problem I mean, there's so many stories in the book i know so many but the way she i mean i guess you know the story of sleeping beauty that the village where sleeping beauty was born uh was uh completely uh, destroyed in, in economic terms because of the destruction uh, of all the spinning wheels. Uh, 
um, so the, the village was uh, um, a village where they produce beautiful yarn and beautiful uh, uh, um, patterns and materials was famous all over the world. And that was their business. Uh, they, they had the ships, uh, then you know, people would uh, raise the ships and then somebody else you know, would produce the wool. So everybody was happy. And then all of a sudden, the destruction of the basic of the industry of textile comes to prevent uh, Sleeping Beauty from uh, becoming Sleeping Beauty. Right. And, yeah, and, and everything gets destroyed. I think it's so interesting today to draw a parallel about the lockdown also. Mm. I, mean, I mean, you could say to a certain extent that the cure may be you know, worse uh, than the sickness, uh, because, you know, in the end, if you destroyed the economy, if you destroyed the social, more than the economy, I would say the lockdown and also the story of Sleeping Beauty, it's the social um, tapestry of society that gets completely destroyed. Uh, and then you end up uh, uh, in a situation where everything is uh, <clears throat> scary, meaning you know people are stealing from each other because of poverty uh, there is uh, um, environmental uh, degradation all of those things so in the end the um uh, the fourth fairy the one that they still has the power when sleeping beauty finally you know, uh, hits uh, uh, with the with the needle and falls asleep, she decides that everybody should sleep for 100 years because she was afraid that maybe, you know, the prince will come sleep and beauty will wake up and then all of a sudden they were in the middle of, you know, a slum, you know, instead of, you know, a nice little village. So that's the, that's the story that my grandmother told me. And then, you know, of course, <coughs> also the prince, the prince comes and search for a kingdom that he had heard was a kingdom that produced the most beautiful fabrics, uh, knitted fabrics in the world, the most amazing yarn. So he was also interested in knitting. And, and this is how he ends up um, in, the, in the village. And this is how he ends up you know, uh, falling in love with Sleeping Beauty. So everything is related to knitting. Uh, which I thought it was fantastic because we were knitting all the time. I mean, this was also our entertainment. So um, I thought that story, uh, and then the end, of course, uh, they they marry and they start uh, restart the business because, of course, you know everything can go back. I mean, people woke up, so they still had the expertise that they had before. Um, and then they start uh, all over again, this amazing business and this place goes back to be an absolutely, you know, idyllic uh, little village. So again, you know, it's, uh, <clears throat> I think we can draw a parallel to today is the fact that uh, it's not enough uh, that the state prints money and showers people with money. Uh, money is not enough. Uh, what you need is to be engaged. So what you need is to do something that makes you proud, that, that takes time, that, uh, where you put your heart in it. Uh, um, and that requires, of course, uh, a social structure that cannot be maintained if everybody's locked inside their homes. The parallels between the power of knitting and what's going on right now in 2020 are incredible i'm assuming you wrote this pre-pandemic yes i did so it's yeah. it's yeah. quite astounding how how relatable it is to what we're going through right now and thank you for educating me that sleeping beauty is a knitting story because i had never thought of it before even yeah. though the spinning wheel is such a major part well yeah but this is the thing i think my grandmother produced that because of the spinning wheel I mean, it, the spinning wheel is central. So it's also, if you think about, you know, why why does uh, the um, the old fairy decided that this is what's going to happen to Sleeping Beauty? She could have 
pick something else, you know? Could have said, oh, she goes and pick up a rose or yeah. something. She can prick herself in her mm -hmm. finger with the rose or something like that. And I think the reason why she, she chose that is, is because the spinning wheel has been central uh, to life uh, mm -hmm. for, uh, for millennials, basically. Yeah. And think it of all of the different communities we know of that textiles was their main bread and butter and then yeah. it's gone to the wayside because of man-made, you know, plastic. Yes, yes, exactly. Okay. So there's a scene in the book where you're on a bus to Cusco and you meet Felipe. Uh -huh. I love that you approach the history of knitting within this story with Felipe. Yeah. Felipe. Felipe. Yeah. No, Felipe. No, Felipe. Of course, it's his real name, but it was called Felipe in uh, yes, right. in Spanish. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I love that scene. And then um, I wanted to talk about knitting in Iraq. I, I would love for you to tell the viewers about these lace shawls that can pass through a wedding ring. Can you talk about that? Yeah, but this is, uh, yeah, but this is something that you also find in the north, uh, in the Faroe Islands. Uh, um, so I assume uh, that this is a tradition that comes from, uh, um, uh, I, I would say um, nomads, nomad uh, animal. Yes, nomadic tradition. Because uh, so basically, they uh, they take the um, uh, the air of the animal uh, in Iraq. Uh, they use goats uh, uh, because you know they have lots of goats there. Um, and they and the same thing actually they do also in Pakistan, and and it's so so soft, uh, so tiny also that then you know, they uh, knit it uh, with super super small needles, uh, and this becomes so incredibly soft that if you have a shawl, I mean we're talking about a real shawl that goes around, uh, you can actually pass it through a wedding ring. So imagine it has to be like this in space. Um, uh, it, it takes a, a phenomenal, phenomenal amount of time to do it. But then again, what is time? You, you know, we, in our life, uh, we think one hour is, wow, you know, it's a long time. But people that live in nomadic society, they have you know, all day in front of them for days on end when they have moved from one camp to another camp, for example. I, I, I think they have a completely different concept of time and also of value of time. Do they live better than us? Uh, I probably, I don't, I don't know, but I think uh, that when I have more time at my disposal, I feel that I truly enjoyed the day more than when I'm running from A to B to C all day long. Uh, it's almost like, you know, time can stretch. And if you have all day, you can stretch it. Uh, and a day can look as long as a week and you feel like you have achieved so much more than other days in which you know, you're too busy and, and the time has actually got smaller. That's another great parallel for right now because we're all like, what day is it? <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh. What day is it? Uh, let's talk about the heroism of women in the Revolutionary War and how they used the fiber arts to fight. Uh, you can talk about maybe the French, you can touch on the French Revolution too. The, um, I really like when you talked about reality versus how Dickens talked about the market women. And their yeah, but that was also my grandmother, by the way. Okay. So, I mean, the thing is that I was reading uh, the tale of two cities. I mean, I loved Dickens. I actually loved all the English writers. And this is why I ended up living uh, in England, because uh, I really wanted to live in a place where people can write such beautiful stories. Uh, so I was uh, reading the tale of two cities. And, you know, it's in that there is a uh, a part in which there are these women sitting in front of the uh, um, guillotine uh, knitting. Uh, and Dickens says that Madame Lafarge, she was actually encoding the names of the people that were killed, they were 
uh, beheaded in the guillotine uh, on this uh, pattern that she was knitting. And then my grandmother, you know, said, oh, so I was telling my grandmother, of course, and um, my grandmother said, well, I mean, that's ridiculous uh, because uh, I said, what do you mean it's ridiculous? I mean, this is a Charles Dickens, I mean, yeah. And she said, so, well, you know, these women were uh, uneducated, uh, so they couldn't read and write. So you tell me how they could write the name of the people on what they were knitting. And, uh, and I thought, oh my gosh, yeah, she's right. She's absolutely right. I mean, how can you write uh, in, in knitting if you don't know how to write on a piece of paper? So that was uh, quite a revelation uh, to me that showed me that I mean, the teaching of that particular situation is the fact that you should question everything. I mean, it doesn't, and again, this is a, a also a good lesson for today, is that they tell you one thing, uh, uh, is it true, is it not true? It is up to you to find out. I mean, you got to make an effort. You have to investigate because it is your life. Uh, so that was, <laughs> but having said that, um, the, the women did participate uh, enormously in French Revolution. In fact, you know, they did start the French Revolution because the, the people that marched on Versailles initially were the market women, you know, where Madame Lafarge was uh, working. So these were the women that demanded bread. And, uh, and this is where the famous sentence of Marie Antoinette comes, said, oh, you know, if they don't have bread, why don't they cake, you know, that. So, but these women were progressively pushed away from the core of the revolution by the men. So initially the women could participate in the trials. Uh, they could sit in the balcony so they could see what was happening underneath with the trials. But then uh, the, their presence was a threat uh, to the um, revolutionary committees because of course they were so important so they were evicted they were prohibited from going to watch these trials even you know in the balcony and this is when they decided that, that they, they would sit in front of the guillotine so they took their the chairs from their home they put them around the guillotine and in between one execution to another they would meet because i mean these are women they had to be productive all the time. They rented the chairs to people that wanted to watch particular executions and they sold to people what they were knitting. Now, the best item, the most popular item was you know, the Phrygian hat, you know, the red hat that also Marianne wears in, uh, uh, in the pictures. Uh, of um, this woman that represents you know, the French re Revolution. Uh, um, and this was uh, extremely successful. Yeah, so this Here is, it is in the book and there's actually a pattern for it too. Yeah, and that's the pattern. That's an historical pattern because it was not easy to find the pattern. So, so these women uh, um, with this activity, renting the chairs and selling, uh, their knitted items uh, produce enough money to keep their family going while you know the men were busy enjoying themselves um, in the revolution <laughs> so i thought it was fantastic i thought you know it was a uh, it was a way for these women to really be part of history at the time in which society was constantly pushing them uh, uh, on the fringes of history um, and that happened through knitting because that knitting was a central activity of their life. What is a knitting spy? Oh yeah, that's the other one. The, the knitting spy. So um, knitting is a binary uh, as the Morse code. So you can encode in knitting uh, um, messages uh, um, using exactly the same system that you use in the Morse code. So, I mean, knitting, uh, so you're gonna knit and purr basically. So the knitting spies were a group of women that were employed by all the um, 
secret services of various countries. So we're not only talking about the United Kingdom uh, uh, or the, the French resistance, we're also talking about the Germans. Uh, so there were um, uh, women that would move around in certain areas. I mean, the, the, in the book, there are a few stories uh, of women that were parachuted you know, behind enemy lines uh, in occupied France in World War II, for example. Mm, and they would uh, go, I mean, there was one story in particular, is this one that would cycle uh, in uh, uh, the areas occupied by the Nazis uh, and um, with, in their basket are knitting, and then you should watch what you know the movement of the troops was, and she would stop, and then knit the position, and then in the evening she would uh, uh, go to a place where she could transmit these messages and use the, whatever she had knitted in order to remember what she had seen. So the the, the it's interesting that. The knitting spies were uh, not uh, infrequent. There were many, but it's interesting that uh, there hasn't been a film or anything, uh, you know, big. I mean, do that you think about like an amazing you know, movie? That sounds like an amazing. Yeah, I would make. Yeah, it would make an amazing, an amazing movie. But yeah. So Greg introduced you to craftivism. There's a whole love chapter to Greg. Yeah, you want to <laughs> yeah. so he was that he, he was a, a, a true hippie. He was a definitely a Nazi sixties hippie. I didn't know about craftism until uh, I think in it's 2005, 2006 when when he told me that this is the last time I heard from him and uh, and he was surprised that I didn't know. But then again, you see, the, the world today is so much more interconnected than it was at that time. Um, also, what I say in the book that I discovered is the fact that knitting uh, has not really been uh, um, uh, considered as a political weapon. Uh, um, so although, you know, we have the pussy out movement, although, you know, we have uh, craftism, uh, which is going on for a very long time, and um, w w what is crafting, of course, uh, it is using knitting as a process, so you, you can do yarn bombing, like, you know, cover a tree with beautiful, you know, crochet or hand knitted uh, material in order to bring about awareness of how we're destroying uh, our trees, uh, or you know, you can cover a lamppost uh, um, in in a section of town where, where there's been uh, environmental degradation because there's no interest at all in um, creating parks or, or areas for children to play, um, so that you bring awareness to that. Um, so this is what it is basically. Um, I think recently, uh, I would say maybe in the last couple of years, uh, there's been more awareness, but never, I mean, there've been, you know, articles, but still, I think the biggest, biggest success was the Pussy Hat Movement, uh, uh, because not even the initiative carried out, but the same group that did the Pussy Hat about covering the, the wall that Trump wanted to build between Mexico and the United States with blankets, not even that has had so much press coverage as the Pussy at uh, the demonstration in Washington DC. Yeah, and that was just 20, what, 2017? <clears throat> yeah. 2016, yeah. yeah. Okay, so that's really recent is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, yeah. All right, so there's a few quotes that I feel really relate to now. And I think they're important because we all deal with our own challenges. Like you said, this book was sort of a healing journey for you and your own personal trauma. And then collectively, we're also experiencing this pandemic. So there's the umbrella trauma and then the individual. So I wanted to just share a few quotes from the book and, and you can respond. So the first is, War is the pattern we are knitting, an elusive war, because it is not on our doorstep, but inside our souls. And the second quote is, knitting helps us cope with the unexpected dark moments of our lives. 
Yeah. Mm. I feel like when all of this happened, us knitters, we were, we were ready for this. We're like, we've been training for this moment, this 20, this year of 2020, we know how to handle this, get the yarn out. So uh, yes, 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 yes. I mean, uh, yeah, I think, um, well, I think, you know, I had my um, pandemic uh, when I wrote this book, because, you know, I was, uh, I mean, I was uh, completely, uh, um, Focus. I was so focused uh, on getting out uh, of that horrid situation I was in uh, that it's almost like, you know, shut uh, the rest of the world out. And all I did um, was uh, um, find a way to get out, so do things uh, towards the goal of getting out of that situation and knit because the knitting was in my comfort zone. So, you know, I went to war every morning uh, and then you know, when I need the break, I would knit and that was my comfort zone. And then, you know, we go back to war and it went on and on and on. Now, there was absolutely no certainty about the outcome. So I didn't know if I was gonna make it or not. I didn't know when I was going to make it, meaning I, I, I didn't know when everything would end for the positive or the negative, which is exactly where we are today. You know, you don't know when it's going to end, or if it's going to end, because I mean, you may think, yes, maybe this one is going to end, but then there's going to be another one, then another, another. Uh, so you don't know the timing. Uh, and this is very much a war. I mean, you know, this is, I, I never, experience a war, but, but remember what my grandmother used to say about the war, I would say that these are the two most difficult circumstances in which people find themselves at time of war. Um, it's not the fear, it's not, it's not even the fear to, to die, to be honest, because in the end, my grandmother ne never said, oh, you know, we were afraid to die under, you know, the bombing or things like that. And, and I thought, you know, think about uh, the Blitz in, in London. People went through the Blitz for three years uh, and, and life carried on. I think the real, real problem is inside yourself uh, uh, is the fact that you live in this uncertainty. And we are not used to live in this kind of uncertainty because we are not programmed for something like that. And that's why we have so much men mental illness. So the knitting is fundamental because if you have a, a comfort zone, then that comfort zone is really what m will make a big difference between surviving, uh, going through and not surviving uh, and not going through. We um, only have a few minutes left, so I'm just going to mention a few things that I wish we could have talked about, but that you can find <laughs> in the book if you get it. One was, I loved the, the chapter on feminism and the love-hate relationship with yarn. It was really fascinating. Yeah. That's when you referenced the yarn cage, which you kind of spoke about at the beginning today. Also, you do touch on neuroscience, which you just were mentioning mental health. So. The, there's a brain hat pattern, which I would have loved to do it's about 10 years ago. And I had a brain event myself and turned to the fiber okay. arts for healing. And then you talk about knitting as a workout for the brain. So that's really where, why I have returned to it because of the trauma of that health brain event that I had. And then I love that you talked about knitting as currency and the pioneer women. There's a great quote that says, like a prayer, the clicking sound of the knitting needles brought comfort and hope to women thrown into an unknown world full of peril, violence, and harshness. And if that's not something we can relate to today, I don't know what else is relatable in this book. So thank you so much for touching on all of that. And I wish we could chat for hours and hours more, but it means you need to get the book, The Power of Knitting. And I just wanna thank you so much for your time today. And if you have any parting words, now would be the time to share. No, thank you so much. I think, you know, we covered uh, the most important parts, but yes, there's so much more. <laughs> but thank you. I really, really enjoyed it. 
Loved it so much. I will link underneath this video to everything I can find about Loretta. Maybe you want to get the book on North Korea too, you know, just. <laughs> well, if you want to know the story of Kim Jong-un, absolutely. <laughs> um, and with that, I will just say thank you and goodbye. Okay, goodbye.